Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Open Door, uh, a panel presentation that is open to the spirit of God's love, open to all of his creation, especially open to the human person made in God's very image and likeness. This morning, we're going to continue along the lines of the last few months now, we're going to look at uh, the American Solidarity Party, which is the only active party in the United States that has the structure and the inspiration of the great tradition of Christian democratic parties. Uh, in particular, going to look at the plank of the party that addresses health and welfare, and that's a, a very, very, very broad range of considerations for one very modest plank to address. And what I'll do, and this is the usual format, is I'll read... I will read the two or three sentences that introduce the platform and see if our participants, and who are they this week? Desmond Silvera, uh, National Committee Member for the American Solidarity Party. And I don't want to bestow a title on him that he wouldn't uh, recognize. But we have a Mr. John Breen who has been suggested to us by Sebastian Mafoud, our producer. And uh, John Breen is a young man, a regular uh, participant. Rhonda Chervin bills herself as an octogenarian. Uh, Desmond Silvera claims to be in the neighborhood of 40 as in 40-ish, and John Breen, as, a, as an undergrad, undergrad is, is no doubt very close to, to half of Desmond Silvera's age. So uh, I will be asking Desmond and John to, to comment so far as they would like to comment, and Desmond knows that if he doesn't comment, I'll probably begin a spontaneous lecture which will prompt him to comment, and I'm sure John will protest as well. We have then the preamble. In recognizing all persons, in recognizing all persons equal right to life, we call for the government's assurance of a robust safety net to stop preventable deaths and reduce affronts to human dignity due to inadequate nutrition, clothing, shelter, safety, or health care. We also recognize that meaningful work according to a person's abilities is essential to human dignity, whether or not this work is remunerated by a market economy. Well, Desmond and John have this uh, preamble before them, but our, our gentle auditors very likely do not. So I'm going to go through that one more time. In recognizing all persons equal right to life, looks like this is going to be the foundation for everything that comes. We call for the government's assurance of a robust safety net to stop preventable deaths and reduce affronts to human dignity due to inadequate nutrition, clothing, shelter, safety, or health care. 
We also recognize that meaningful work according to a person's abilities is essential to human dignity. Whether or not this work is remunerated by a market economy. Gentlemen, any thoughts so far? Can you hear me? You sure can. Uh, I, this is um, uh, this is Desmond. Um, I think that this is a good common sense plank. Uh, our our party being in favor of uh, common sense, common good, and um, <coughs> uh, it it looks out for um, the the needs of uh, our society as a whole. And John. Well, what we're talking about here is not just nice things that everyone needs. You know, it's just it's every it's a thing that everybody has a right to. So when we come to just a platform, when we are talking about human dignity, and and when we specify it in the fields of nutrition, clothing, shelter, safety, or healthcare, we're talking about basic rights that that are we're talking about like non-negotiables here, where everyone has a right to those things. So it can't be really just a platform just to get in political office. These need to be these are intrinsic to selecting a candidate, and the candidate has to be serious on these issues. Now, we know that a candidate is only limited by uh, his personality, for one, and whatever uh, office he's trying to get into. But regardless of the amount of political power he aspires to, these are the things that he has to keep in mind. Non-negotiable. We won't take a candidate seriously that is committed to these goods. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in a nutshell, yeah. All right. Let me offer a couple of comments here. We're still in the preamble. There's a distinction that's worth making between a, a core human right and a core human right is, is one that's based on a core basic good of the person. And oftentimes, core human rights can be stated negatively, as in no one can, or it's never the case that. Distinction between a, a core human right and an auxiliary human right or a helping human right. And I think in some respects, when we talk about the particulars that come with a safety net and health care and the like, we're, we're drawing on the right to life as a core human right based on the basic good of life and uh, a range of conditions that need to be present if we're to enjoy the right to life, if we're to realize the, the good of life. Uh, and I, I think, uh, in a way, that's linked to the term, whether it was deliberate or not by the drafters of this, the term inadequate, inadequate. Uh, it, it's certainly not the case that we can pledge here and now that everyone will have the best possible diet, but they ought to have their basic nutritional needs met. Uh, I suppose we carry that inadequate along. I'm sure that everybody would like a uh, 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 everybody who uh, is of uh, 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 the GQ persuasion would like to have a three-piece suit with a, a, a Blenheim after the fashion of Winston Churchill bow tie. But, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about adequate nutrition, adequate clothing, adequate shelter, and, and decent health care. I'm sure that everyone who has a, 
uh, an illness, especially a significant illness, would be be interested in having VIP treatment at the Mayo Clinic. But our resources aren't such that we can actually provide that. But what we can guarantee is that no one will, will be subject to an attack on his or her life. And if you undermine the material and social conditions necessary to pursue the good of life, at some point what you're doing amounts to an attack on the good of life. Uh, I hope that distinction helps to some extent. Uh, one might say, for example, that no one ought ever to attack another, but whether or not we can provide round-the-clock police protection to everybody is another matter altogether. There has to be at least adequate police protection. Let me go ahead and also make a comment on the last uh, sentence here in this short preamble. Looking at it, it's the second sentence. We also recognize that meaningful work according to a person's ability is essential to human dignity. Whether or not this work is remunerated by a market economy, so the title of the blank is health and welfare, part of a person's welfare or well-being is meaningful work. Now, I don't think it follows that we can in the party say, we hereby guarantee full employment for everyone uh, in accord with their preferences. That's not what's being claimed. But we can certainly argue that there's work to be done in the United States, all kinds of work to be done in the United States, and that people ought to be in a position to carry out that work. Comments on my gloss, as they say. Uh, I I agree. Um, I think that uh, work is basic, is a, is a is essential component to human dignity, and uh, we need an economy that gives uh, work uh, people the the opportunity to work. There's a, there's a historical anecdote of interest here. Uh, once upon a time, and this is getting on to be probably four decades ago, uh, Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker ran a number of pieces uh, about a fellow named, uh, a unique reformer named Danilo Dolce. And a lot of Dulcie's work was in Sicily. And there was then, as there is now, endemic corruption. And the labor force itself was corrupted. And there was all kinds of work to be done, but people somehow couldn't do it. So Dulce, Dulce Danilo Dulce, uh, developed something he called a reverse strike. Are there roads that need to be repaired? Is there somehow no funding for it? Or is there somehow no official go-ahead to make use of that funding? Very well, let's ourselves organize, get the best materials we can, and go out and start to repair the roads. Or uh, switch to our own time. Uh, is there a, a, a seemingly intractable problem with illiteracy? Is it the case that all kinds of young people and an embarrassing number of adults can't really read? Well, what we could do is organize uh, little bands of tutors. Uh, we don't have to wait for the government to provide something. We can go out and provide it on our own. Now, that kind of citizen initiative doesn't replace, of course, the need for government. Uh, subsidiarity doesn't mean that we always do everything at the grassroots because there's some things that can't properly be done uh, at that level. 
But there are any number of opportunities for good work that people could do if they uh, have a little bit of the sense of a reverse strike. Another theme here, and I'm thinking of what John is saying, uh, these aren't just nice words. You know, even these nice words are contentious. Uh, twice in this two-sentence preamble, reference is made to dignity as well as it might be. And uh, the documents of Vatican Council too frequently refer to dignity. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, as of 1947-48, United Nations, frequently refers to dignity. In fact, rather than give some sort of foundational ethical argument for human rights, it begins with, in light of human dignity. But, but, there is a, a developed, a developed, what should I say, uh, campaign, intellectual uh, uh, challenge being given to the role of dignity in the public square. For example, maybe getting on to be four or five years ago, uh, a very prolific writer, commentator, economist slash biologist Steven Pinker uh, had a piece called the stupidity of dignity. And he argued that it was a concept that really couldn't be made much of. It was a concept that were we to examine its, its uh, history, would have only too close ties to the dignity of the aristocracy. And Pinker and others have suggested that we focus on autonomy rather than dignity autonomy rather than dignity, and autonomy is a term stressed in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, but it's worth noting that there are degrees of autonomy, and the more vulnerable we become, in many regards, the less autonomous we are. But when it comes to human dignity, the core concept is such that it doesn't admit of degrees. We can't say that Abel has more human dignity than Baker, or Baker has more human dignity than Charlie or Charlotte. Dignity is too deep a concept, too deep a reality, as believers we hold, to admit of degrees. So even, even in the preamble to the plank, the focus on dignity puts the American Solidarity Party in what I would call the classical tradition of respect for persons as opposed to what in the end I think is a, a power-based uh, nod in the direction of autonomy, which is precarious and also oftentimes mythical. We're not nearly so autonomous as we might take ourselves to be. Well, that said, and remember, folks, you can interrupt me at any time. Let me go to the first bullet point. Diverse efforts across this country to secure universal health care access. We support this. Diverse efforts across this country to secure universal health care ac access affordability and outcomes, including single-payer health initiatives, health care cooperatives, and hybrid systems at the state and national level. Well, that's a lot to support. What is it again? It's the first bullet. Diverse efforts across this country to secure universal health care access, affordability, and outcomes, including single-payer health initiatives, healthcare cooperatives, and hybrid systems at the state and national level. Comments. 
I think that uh, um, uh, the uh, well, uh, healthcare, whether it be statewide or national, um, is part of a, a healthy society, and um, I don't think we have. I don't, we as a party, we don't have a perfect solution, a perfect proposal, a perfect implementation, but uh, we certainly support uh, evaluation of many different systems, um, uh, as, as the plank said, as the bullet point says, both at the national and state levels and um, of different forms. And and that is uh, an expression, I think, of uh, the decentralist spirit of the party. Let's do some looking around and some experimenting, and and there's this notion of cooperatives right there in the in the language cooperatives. Yeah, I, I personally prefer uh, something done at a more. At, at a lower level than the national level, I, I, I think it would be ideal to have state-based systems so that we can compare what works uh, by looking at the, the different states and um, refine the systems over time. But um, a, a national system can work as well as, uh, as long as... Um, it doesn't impose uh, too much. Um, it, as long as it does, doesn't impose too much on uh, on on the citizens. Um, I, I know that the uh, U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops uh, strongly pushed on health care reform, um, but. Once uh, the talk came to abortion and Planned Parenthood and contraception, then um, you know, those are those I, I personally don't think should be included in health care. So there's certainly a line. Yes, and in the state of California, unlike the uh, <coughs> state of Connecticut where John hails from. No, I'm not even going to mention that some people call that the nutmeg state. I'm just not even going to mention that. Uh, in the state of California, uh, health care now includes uh, physician-assisted suicide. That's California. And, <clears throat> of course, it's being California, uh, we have a, a euphemism. It's not really physician-assisted suicide. It's aid in dying. Aid in dying. And uh, the law is such that if you have the uh, death certificate of somebody who has been aided to die, reference isn't made to the uh, drug that was used to aid this person to die, but reference is made to... Uh, the initial disease that has brought the person to uh, the medical crisis that he or she is, is now in. And uh, I think there are places, I can name one, my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, where it would take, and it should take, about an hour to explain how it could be possible that anybody could think that physician-assisted suicide was aid in dying, and how it could be possible that the method used to bring about death isn't mentioned on the uh, death certificate, and, and how it is that the state will uh, give medical coverage for that, all in the name of equal access to health. So one of the things that's confounding one of the things that is confounding, because there's so many of them, that when you look to construct a, a good healthcare system, you have to work your way through all sorts of built-in perversions. 
which is really what they amount to. Now I'm going to turn to John here. The reason why I'm turning to you, John, is because when I read this, I can't help but think of my daughter, Zoe, who is uh, now at the tender age of 27 and has moved past the point where she can rely on the health care coverage of her parents and has ventured out into securing her own health care and uh, I think she's shown a greater interest in economics than ever before in her life at this point with this kind of incentive. And I wonder if you have some thoughts for us about, well, how the young people at, at your school uh, are inclined to think about these matters and, and how you think about them. Um. Well, that, number one, actually, I'm not from Connecticut. Um, oh. I'm from, actually from, I'm from Chicago area, so that's, I'm in the hub there. I'm in the suburbs there. So, Are you uh, a distance learner? Yes, I am, actually. Ah, also, we got some technology in works. Yes, okay, well, I'm not even so. going to mention, I'm not even going to mention the endemic corruption in Chicago, Illinois, so let's get past that, too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not the best. Actually, just recently, our governor um, signed into law against his promise that um, a bill which gives basically unlimited access to abortion and uh, contraceptives, things like that. Back in April, he promised that he wasn't going to sign it into law, but then um, when the pressure mounted, he broke. So... So that's the current situation we're facing now. You know, it's, we already have, you know, a huge debt there. So when you have a huge debt, you know, when in doubt, kind of does build. But anyways, um, back to the to the uh, the bullet point that we are at here, though. Um, the first thing that struck out at me was um, the, the diverse efforts. Right now, what we're experiencing here in the country is a uh, one-size-fits-all mentality when it comes to health care. It's not really taken into account to the particular needs of every individual. So my, my particular needs are not going to be the same as someone who's older than me or someone who's younger than me. When we talk about diversity, we have to take into account that there's a pretty wide spectrum of people and mentalities here in this country. That's certainly so. Do you think that uh, people in your rough demographic have this view, or do you think that they're looking closely at health care options? Or is it something that's easily uh, put aside? Uh, I think it's probably overall it's something that's put aside, really. Um, I live in a, a bread and butter town here, but um, I don't think that some I, there's it's just a, an, a, an option that not too many people think of because. They don't really think of the cultural diversity that makes up this country. So, John, what would be, in your opinion, what would be the best approach to address the lack of diversity in in healthcare? The the, the lack of uh, diversity of in in meeting the needs of people. Do you have a, uh, any particular proposal? Yeah. Well just the acceptance of alternative medicine into our public health care system where they allow insurance companies to cover for them. That would be a, a big major one because if you have to respect a person's right to choose what form of health care that they want, you know, in a moral, morally speaking. So say if a person doesn't want to go through Western medicine, they should still be able to get coverage if they decide to go through an alternative route. So they um, say like traditional Chinese medicine, you know, that's 
that's one thing that is an alternative, the more traditional way of dealing with things than the, the public health system can do, or when I should say our Western medicine. So that's just one example there, where a lot of people, where they want to take an alternative health care route, something that's more in pace with their lifestyle, something they can understand, and, some, and they're willing to, to wait a little longer to achieve a better end as opposed to trying to get a quick result, maybe a little too fast. So people actually have to go and pay cash for this alternative form of health medicine because their health care their healthcare insurance doesn't cover it. Now, I suspect that uh, neither Desmond or I, uh, I know in my case I didn't, didn't expect that example. I think it's a very interesting example. And uh, the, the field of medical anthropology is, is certainly an expanding one, an in-depth study of forms of medical care in, in different cultures. As it happens, going down memory lane, the first paid job I had as a philosophy grad student was working with doing research for a, a psychiatrist who was trying to get a handle on how different cultures responded to pain and reported pain. And I, that was a very interesting first job. But I want to connect the medical anthropology, alternative forms of healthcare, and the like with a specific uh, concept in this first bullet point. Here, here it goes again. Diverse efforts across this country to secure universal health care access, affordability, and outcomes. I have no doubt but what uh, government agencies that aren't inclined to support alternative medicine, at least in various forms, I have no doubt that they would bring forward statistics that, that suggest that many forms of alternative medicine have led many people to die unnecessarily of cancer. And uh, we had uh, a, a recent example of, of that. Uh, the, the famous uh, high-tech pioneer who did alternative medicine until it was too late and wound up dying of cancer. And that's certainly not to say that that would always be the case, but uh, I, I think that there is a room, there is room for a, a, a national medical review board. Uh, another example of that, and I, I can't help but speak about California, we have here, and it's not the only place in the country, real fights about, uh, grassroots fights, about mandatory vaccines. Mm -hmm. Now what the outcomes people will say is, here is such and such a, a statistical base. Within the statistical base, people who have had this vaccine fare much better than people who don't have this vaccine. Moreover, people who don't have this vaccine make it more likely that people who uh, uh, don't have this vaccine or even have had this vaccine will be exposed unnecessarily. And I don't think that that's something that really can be decided by, by uh, uh, the, the mayor or the mayor and the mayor's council. I think it should have broadest, broadest citizen output. And I think that when people appeal to statistics, we ought to remember that there are lies, damn lies in statistics. But this notion of outcomes is interesting. Um, I wonder if the party can really say uh, that what we want is the same outcome for various groups with regard to various uh, illnesses and the like. John, anything else on that since you got us on the alternative medicines? 
Um, as far as uh, the vaccines, um, I've talked to a medical doctor, and he actually said that many of the new vaccines are basically immoral for Catholics to take because a lot of them contain byproducts of aborted fetuses. So in that respect, you know, it's almost difficult to take vaccines, and, and it's up to the government to allow parents to opt out of vaccines and opted out for their children as well. Recently in Michigan, there was a mother who was jailed because she refused to vaccinate her sons. It was a case where um, it was a divorced couple. The father wanted his son vaccinated. The mother didn't. She refused to do it because she had custody of the child. Um, she was sued, arrested, and while she was in jail, the father had custody of the child, and he got the vaccine for him. Mm. And I think since then, there, is, there was another mother who's been jailed. I haven't looked up on that case um, yet. But when we're talking about diverse effort, having mandatory vaccines, I don't see how that fits into um, this call here and this bullet point here for diverse efforts. Sure, the vaccines have a place, and they have a proper function. But I think what we're experiencing now is an over-vaccination of our young people, and that's been uh, contributing to a lot of the problems, a lot of the health problems, a lot of health complications that we're having with our young people. There are certainly efforts here in California to mandate uh, HPV vaccinations for adolescents on the grounds that this will prevent STDs. They're an acronym, they're an acronym, everywhere an acronym. Prevent STDs uh, uh, in an important way. And the alternative argument, or the response argument, since the word alternative is already on the board, is that such vaccines might actually promote a false sense of uh, security and safety and actually lead to uh, greater uh, promiscuity. Uh, it's very hard to figure these things out. And certainly, certainly, I think, and I found this in plank after plank, the, the, the language used in these various planks is open to and in fact encourages the close examination of, of people who know what's happening in a technical sense, in a very specific sense. Uh, nothing is meant to foreclose research, but it does, I think, in general lead to a kind of insistence that the public be able to question and address research and do so in a public context. One thought on the vaccines, there's a very important concept in, in Catholic moral theology, and I think it's very important in common sense as well, the notion of material cooperation. If someone develops a vaccine, let's say in, in year X, and does so by using uh, the, the tissues of some sort or other, the tissues of, a, of an aborted baby, that person is, is acting precisely to bring about what he or she brings about by using the, the remains of an abortion. But suppose it's not happening in, let's say, the year of inception of the vaccine, but suppose it's something that's happening 35 years later. Uh, and suppose there aren't any health alternatives to the vaccine. Suppose the vaccine is, is a proven benefit. A, well, now, there's certainly nothing that's, that's de fide, a matter of faith. But a number of, of respected Catholic ethicists have argued that in a case like that, where there's no good alternative to the use of the vaccine, uh, and there's a very, very, very distant link with the original development of the vaccine, 
that w w would be permissible to use the vaccine, not obligatory, but permissible. And there again is something that I, I think the party were, were to dig and dig and dig and have committee hearings on such matters. That's the sort of thing that the party would, would want to explore. But, but now we're really into the area of conscience, and, and I want to do a little skipping. We've looked at the first point, the second point, the third point. The fourth point, the fourth bullet, reads this way. We therefore support a health and welfare system that includes conscience protections for employers and charities that do not wish to participate in activities that contradict their sincerely held moral convictions. So, do we want to promote health care? Of course we do. But we support a health and welfare system that includes conscience protection for employers and charities that do not wish to participate in activities that contradict their sincerely held moral convictions. I don't think that would get any support at all from any uh, Democratic uh, leaders, uh, leaders of the Democratic Party in the state of California. What would you say, Desmond? I, I think you're right. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a very popular topic among uh, the Democrats. Uh, or, or, uh, but um, among the American Solidarity Party, that's one of our most important concepts, religious liberty. And um, I, I think it's, what, it's one of the, the main things that prompted uh, uh, a new party to, to pop up and, and gain as much a, attention as, as we've gotten so far. Because there, there are already, there's already socially conservative parties and economically progressive parties. We combine both. Uh, the, the Democrats really couldn't um, draw in people that, uh, that have um, religious liberty as, as an important um, consideration. Though the party language is, is uh, very broad here, sincerely held moral convictions. Uh, I imagine that a significant majority of people who would uh, argue that conscience doesn't allow them to participate in such activities would be people who, who are religious. But what we have here is simply regard for moral convictions. Um, I, I think of uh, the, the history of conscientious objection to uh, military participation in the United States. Because of the role of the peace churches, uh, the, the right to conscientious objection was acknowledged. And among those peace churches historically, was not the Roman Catholic Church, although there were Roman Catholics who, as early as World War I, uh, opposed military participation on, on moral grounds. But the historic peace churches were uh, critical in developing uh, conscientious objection recognition. But then, and I think this happened in the late 50s or early 60s, probably more the early 60s, conscientious objection was extended to uh, people who do not claim any kind of religious affiliation but simply argued uh, and I think argued well and reasonably that when a war is unjust or when warfare has come to be such that it can be predictably assumed that it will become unjust even if it doesn't start out that way they argued that they ought to have conscientious objection status. So I think uh, uh, 
Desmond, do you call attention to how this is something that's been a catalyst for the formation of the party? But in in so developing, it hasn't been something that's been limited. It's a funny word to use here. It's been limited to religious people, but people who want to propose sound reasoning to support uh, nonviolence. I think that's worth noting. I agree. I agree. It, it, it's not limited to religion. As, as you say, um, conscious, conscious, conscientious objection um, is, is any uh, sincerely held moral belief. Yes. When we struggle with these larger words, and I usually do, conscience, conscientiousness, consciousness, it's amazing how often students replace the word conscience with the word conscious. I, I've said to students, now careful, and it seems to increase the incidence of replacing conscience with conscious. At any rate, what I wanted to say, and here's another historical background. Legend has it that the Greek orator, the famous Greek orator Themistocles, would warm up for public declamations in the Agora by speaking for 15 minutes privately with pebbles in his mouth. And then having removed the pebbles from his mouth, he was extremely articulate and never mispronounced anything. Those were the good old days. Those were the good old days when students were disciplined. They couldn't get by with online learning, distance learning. They had to give... Oh, I shouldn't even go there. Uh, John, do you, do you find your friends... Uh, aware of thinking in terms of conscience and public policy? Or is it a matter of organization and public policy? I would say that uh, they would very much consider conscience as something that's very personal. But then I have a pretty uh, queer group of friends, meaning that they're people who actually have a conscience and are not afraid to use it. So the average person out there, I don't think is going to give much of a hoot for conscience or for the conscience rights of others, you know, such as our secular society. So, How would you address that? How would you suggest that people could come to see the importance of conscience? Well, that's something I haven't really gotten into much, but I would probably basically tell them that it's something of, it's a part of your intrinsic fabric. You know, it's not something that you can just cast away. There's a conscious decision to everything, of, what you, of when you're going to wake up, what you're going to do for the day, what shoes you're going to wear, where you're going to go. It all requires a certain level of conscience. But what also with our conscience also goes a sense of morality, which is is a non-negotiable. I like to use that word. But it's you make every every decision regarding your life is a moral decision, really. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, also known as the Common Doctor of the Church, could not agree with you more. He argued that. A human act is, once understood as a human act, a moral act. And if someone said, well, you know, there's morality, there's spirituality, there's artistic uh, 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 concerns, there are political concerns, uh, Thomas would say, you, you can't put morality in a category the way you could put, uh, uh, say, being athletic or, or being an outdoors type or being artsy-fartsy, to coin a term. 
the sphere of morality is the sphere of human action. And in exploring that, he, he would say, and what the sphere of human action needs to be uh, drawn from, based on, is what he would call practical reasoning. How to think through about what to do. How to think through about what to do. And, and you know, you mentioned people not having a conscience. I suspect what he would say is, well, and I think Ben, you went on to say this indirectly, having a conscience is part and parcel of being a, a, a rational animal. And you right. could stifle conscience, but you can't escape conscience. And I think it's very interesting that, that Cardinal Newman would add to that, that yes, uh, from one perspective, a fundamental perspective, conscience is the operation of right reason with regard to how to act. But he said, looked at from another perspective, conscience is God's vicar. After all, our capacity to reason is something given to us by God, and in order to understand our reason, we have to really work our way back to the source of reason. And God's vicar, that's an interesting way of thinking about conscience. Well, uh, I'm looking at something that says we have four minutes left, but we started five minutes late. <clears throat> and Sebastian will have to juggle the times, but that still only gives us nine minutes. And I want to look at one more plank here, which I think is revolutionary. Assurance of a living minimum wage. This is the next to the last bullet point, I'm sorry. <clears throat> next to the last bullet point. Assurance of a living minimum wage calculated by the cost of Raising a family on a single income. Well, why aren't both parents working? Well, why aren't they? Because uh, there's all sorts of work, essential work, that's done in, in making a home. Assurance of a living minimum wage calculated by the cost of raising a family on a single income in each given municipality for all full-time workers. I suspect both parties would talk about the importance of full employment and, and, and suggest in more than one way that both parents ought to be fully employed. And if both parents aren't fully employed, what's the complaint? But the party here is insisting on a, a family wage coming from a single income. That is a radical claim, a radical goal. Right? Sebastian? Yeah. Isn't, isn't that uh, way outside the mainstream? Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I think so. Um, it, I'm not sure uh, everybody in the party has caught on to how far that is outside the mainstream. Yeah, I, I guess I had noticed it myself until you you read it out loud a couple times. Um, I, uh, I I think that. Um, the, the the part I like most about it is uh, where it says um, by mu municipality. So mm -hmm. that, um, it's set at a level um, appropriate for uh, the the locality and isn't necessarily set at a national level or I I don't even know if a state level makes a, as much sense. Um, this is something where, and this is just me personally, but I, I think uh, a minimum wage should be set more locally than, than uh, in, a, in a broader geography. I can imagine that uh, there would be a lot of work to do to, to make that goal 
something that could be realized because there's a whole set of structures that have wage regulations across the board. Although, again in California, uh, there have been local efforts to raise the minimum wage. Well, in that, we're close to our conclusion in terms of time. I wonder if, if you folks would bear with me while I read on this question of a family wage, on this question, something by one of the inspirational figures for the party, G.K. Chesterton. And it's short, and I think it's memorable, and it comes from a book called What's Wrong with the World, written just last year? No. What's Wrong with the World, written in 1910. And Chesterton begins that book, I think it's in the second paragraph, saying, I am a good part of what's wrong with the world. So he doesn't <laughs> excuse himself. But not so very later on, not so very farther on in the book, he says this. I begin with a little girl's hair. That I know is a good thing at any rate, whatever else is evil. The pride of a good mother and the beauty of her daughter is good. It is one of those adamantine tendernesses which are the touchstones of every age and race. If other things are against it, other things must go down. If landlords and laws and sciences are against it, landlords and laws and sciences must go down. With the red hair of one she urchin in the gutter, I will set fire to all modern civilization. Because a girl should have long hair, she should have clean hair. Because she should have clean hair, she should not have an unclean home. Because she should not have an unclean home, she should have a free and leisured mother or father. Because she should have a free mother, she should not have a usurious landlord because there should not be a usurious landlord. There should be a redistribution of property. Because there should be a redistribution of property, there shall be a revolution. That little urchin with the gold red hair, whom I have just watched toddling past my house, she shall not be locked and lamed and altered. Her hair shall not be cut short like a convict. No. All the kingdoms of the earth shall be hacked about and mutilated to suit her. She is the human and sacred image. All around her the social fabric shall sway and split and fall. The pillars of society shall be shaken and the roofs of ages come rushing down and not one hair of her head shall be harmed. Now that, among other things, is all about the need for a family wage. And this was in 1910. And I think red hair figures prominently in it because of the influx, influx of Irish immigrants into to Chesterton's uh, great city of London. So we have a full agenda, but it looks to be that we've almost always had a full agenda in terms of dealing with what's wrong with the world. Now, it might be said, if it's not, it should be said, that this is a tall order. But we know from Scripture that someone has numbered each and every hair of our heads, and that someone is, of course, the strength that we ultimately appeal to. End of this week's free sermon. <laughs> Any other comments? I, I 
agree with you. It's uh, it's a lot of work, but I I think it's worth it. And uh, uh, John, are you willing to sign on? <laughs> I'm very interested in uh, in learning more about it. Um, Chesterton is a very good figure to go to, and one of my favorite things of his is uh, the supreme adventure is being born, and I think yes. that speaks a lot to what uh, this. You know, it's a it's a direct blow against the culture of death of which we're now experiencing and having to endure, and we just need to keep that in our in our fronts there. That you know, being born is the supreme adventure. And like what Bishop Sheen says, uh, all life is worth living. So. Excellent. Our evangelical friends would say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Well, Desmond and John, we've come to the end here. And I want to thank you both for, for joining in on our weekly Pelican Party panel. And I hope to hear from both of you next week. God bless and God speed. Thank you very much, sir. Bye. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. <laughs>